makes decision about attorney discipline. Um, the court writes rules uh, for all the cases that, that uh, uh, come through the court system. And ultimately, the court sets priorities about what today are the kinds of things that our court system and our justice system should be moving forward to. So now let me tell you about who I am and how I got to be somebody making these kind of decisions. Uh, as Andrew said, like Andrea and like Erica, I was a public defender. Uh, after I got out of law school, uh, I began my career as a lawyer in the public defender's office. And that experience transformed who I am. Uh, as a public defender, you take people's lives in your hands. They have no one else in the world, by definition. They have no hope. They have no lifeline. Uh, they, they, they place their, their lives in your hands and you do the best that you can with it. Uh, it, it, it changes who you are as a person. This I know it changed who I am as a person. Um, I, I tried cases as, as a public defender um, for 10 years and then I became a judge. And I've been very fortunate to have sat at every single level of our court system in, in this state. So I too began my career in traffic court, which I agree with Erica is a great place as a judge. Because that is where most people have their contact with the court system. They don't go to the Supreme Court. They don't have those big idea kind of issues. But for that person, that day, their driver's license is everything. So it's a great way to begin a career as a, as a judge. And that's where I began my life. Uh, later, however, uh, I heard uh, felony cases at, at 26th Street. So I kind of went my circle around. I started there. And then I came back to be the judge. Um, and then, uh, after some time, I also heard complex civil litigation. Because of course the court does way more than just criminal cases. In fact, criminal cases maybe take up about not quite half of the court's docket. The rest of the cases are important civil cases as well. And so as a trial judge, I sat in some of those courtrooms and heard some very uh, complex uh, civil cases. And then I was elected to the appellate court. Now, as, as like in the, in the federal system, we have three level rules. The court, the trial court. Uh, where Erica sits, I talked about the Supreme Court, and then there's an intermediate court of review in the middle, and that's the appellate court. Um, I sat there for 17 years. So I heard appellate, uh, I reviewed trial uh, court cases for 17 years. And again, that's every kind of case there is. Uh, probate cases, and accident cases, and contract cases, and as well as criminal cases. So for 17 years, I heard all the kinds of cases you can possibly imagine. And, as I described to you what the Supreme Court does, and that is taking, uh, choosing which cases to hear. Uh, and as told to the court, I'm going to take 15 uh, out of 500 every other month. Um, what that means is that the appellate court is really the court of last resort for about 95% of the cases. That they, that they so I did that for a very long time until last year when the Chief Justice of the Illinois Supreme Court retired and the court chose me to take his place. And so for the last year, I've sat on the Illinois Supreme Court and participated in the decision making of the court. Uh, and it's been an amazing experience. Um, let me, I can talk a little bit about what the court does, but trying to decide if a judge is doing a good job or not is really hard. And, and I think when we talk about you know electing judges, I think it's a good thing that people can choose who good judges are, but clearly it's hard for people to make good choices. And I, I know voters want to make good choices when they vote for judges. It's, 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 it's a challenge. certainly means that this is a, a, important, and other organizations and persons are important, um, but it does mean the voters have to try to educate themselves. Everybody talks about the bar associations, and bar associations are really an important piece of this, because what they do is not just a name game or a popularity contest, they do a very intensive investigation of each one of the judicial candidates. Uh, and then they come up with ratings, and that's the information that you as voters can find. Um, the first time I was rated was in 1982, and my hair wasn't this up. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't think it got many, many, many times. And I've always received the highest ratings of bar associations. And just last month, when uh, the Chicago Bar Association uh, did their evaluation of me, uh, they found me to be highly qualified to continue to sit on our state's highest court. Uh, so that's an important piece as to how the judge goes about doing their job. But the last thing I want to talk about is some of the um, issues that I'm concerned about, that I'm interested in, that uh, even in my short time on the court, I try to make a priority. Uh, and that's our issues about access to justice. 
keeping the courtroom doors open so that people can come to court and have their disputes peaceably resolved in the court system. Now, when we talk about that, very often we're talking about uh, the court. Uh, specifically, you know, we know in criminal cases, people have a right to a lawyer if they can't afford a lawyer. And that's what I did as a public defender, and Andrew and, and Erica all did. As public defenders, we were representing people who couldn't afford a lawyer. But that's in the criminal world. In the civil world, many other countries also provide lawyers for people who can't afford it. But we don't in this country. So it's a real challenge for people who can't afford a lawyer to um, uh, either go into court or just to live our complex lives. I mean, when we think about that, people use your, I, the expression that people use is unmet legal needs. You know, if you can't afford a lawyer, you don't write a will. And then when somebody dies, then the rest of the family is caught with all kinds of financial problems because at the beginning they didn't have a will. Or you can't hire a lawyer to help you write a contract when you enter into a business with your friends, especially your own small business. If you have a lawyer, you can end up with lots and lots of problems down the line. So there are all these issues about what people, how they can live their legal complex lives when they can't afford them. Um, I wrote the rule in law that requires every um, lawyer, uh, when they renew their license, to report how many hours of volunteer service they've done for the court. Um, and, and the purpose of that rule is to remind lawyers every year that a part of being a professional, uh, a part of being having uh, this incredible privilege of representing, is an obligation of service. And so since uh, the rule was drafted, um, lawyers have been reporting on the hours they've done. And just last year, uh, there were uh, the lawyers reported that they did 2.3 million hours of volunteer legal services. And I think that's a very true thing. But, but that's not my um, The issue that I'm concerned about right now is not so much, I mean, I'm concerned about the poor and, and, and what I just described. What I'm really concerned about is the middle class. Because what we're seeing is that these same issues is now coming into the middle class. And the place that you see that, are in really two places. One is in collection cases, and that's usually things like credit card debt. Uh, and then another place, and it's a huge problem across this country, especially in Cook County, um, is in mortgage foreclosure cases. So in Cook County right now, there are pending 77,000 mortgage foreclosure cases. In 90% of those cases, the homeowners do not have lawyers. The banks, of course, are represented by lawyers who understand the very technical world of mortgage foreclosure law. People who are losing their homes have no way. And that's what my concern is. Um, when I first came on the, the Supreme Court, I was interested in this. I was interested in this because judges had come to me and, and talked about how they were concerned about handling these cases day and night and see that there was a problem with the, the, the bank's case, but they've got to be fair and impartial. They can't be the lawyer for the home. We, that's not their role. The judge has to be a neutral person. They have to see the problems with these cases. So the first thing I did when I was appointed the Illinois Supreme Court, I asked the court to make mortgage foreclosure cases a priority. And since then, uh, we've organized a committee of people from across the state. Because this is an issue not just in the county. We understand that our community is here. But this is all downstate. And, and, and as many issues that we do in rural communities, it has a whole other layer of problems. But, um, uh, we brought together people from across the state, bankers and lawyers and people who represent um, uh, homeowners as well as judges and Lisa Maddie's office and others, to try to come up with some kind of rules moving forward so at least there could be some kind of fairness in the system. And also uh, encouraging more lawyers and law students to be able to be available to the homeowners when they come to court. Um, they may still lose their homes, but at least they could have an opportunity to understand the process. Um, so though, that's the issue that I'm most concerned about, um, is, is moving forward on, on uh, uh, specifically uh, uh, mortgage foreclosures. But if I can stay on the court, the issue that I'm concerned about are these, are these ideas about access to justice. One other thing that the court does, the Supreme Court does, when I was describing these different problems, is the Supreme Court is in, in, in charge of filling vacancies on, on the court, on the, on the, the, when there's a judicial vacancy. When we talk a lot about whether it's good or bad to elect judges, um, this is the system we have. Um, but I, I have to say, what we sometimes jump over is that at the, at the first level, 
vacancies are filled by the Supreme Court. We're the only state in the country that does that. And I, I have to believe it's because, frankly, our Constitution thought it was a good idea that nonpartisan people or people who visit bipartisan, like judges in the Supreme Court, people who know something about the court system, should be able to choose good people to fill vacancies. Uh, so you have, for example, the Supreme Court appointed somebody like Eric Friday, who you just met. Um, uh, unfortunately, in our system, however, that appointment doesn't always get a lot of respect. And what happens is people then start running against people like Erica or like me, and, and we have to defend ourselves. But uh, at this point, the, the, the campaigns have begun. Um, I know that uh, for all of you, March 20th seems like a long way away. Uh, I've been campaigning for six months. I know that it's uh, five months and 20 days. <laughs> 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 um, but as, as we go forward, you'll be seeing more about these traditional issues because it's really important uh, who are our judges. That's really where I started, to try to keep up with the nature of this kind of So uh, I hope that as you get to know me and you read some materials about me, that you'll feel that I'm the kind of person with the experience that I've had, the, the, the values that I've, that I've had to try to discuss here, that I'm the kind of person that you would like to see on the last few Now, I will answer any kind of